Last week, an 11-year-old boy named Jacob Wetterling was kidnapped from the streets of St. Joseph, Minnesota. The effect on Jacob's family has been obvious, but his kidnapping has also torn the tightly knit social fabric of the entire town. Our last report tonight is from there. Here's ABC's Chris Bury. The make-believe goblins are in place in this town of under 3,000, but it hardly seems like a holiday. Posters of the abducted boy are reminders of an evil that is all too real. The school bike racks, normally full, were almost empty today because so many parents escorted their children to school. What you just heard was some of the original news footage from 1989, just hours after this event had happened. This is the Rigor Mortis Podcast, and this is the story of Jacob Wetterling. Jason, how you doing, man? I am great. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. Thanks to our Patreon supporters, we were able to get some new equipment. And uh, so we're kind of messing around with that right now. It's great. Thank you, guys. We have a little more space in here and, uh, um, you know, just the overall quality of the equipment uh, is much better. Yeah. So thank you, supporters. And uh, we're looking forward to continuing our podcast. Yes, uh, thank you. So anyways... So what story are we doing today? Well, this is one that I've found interesting for a number of years. This is the story of Jacob Wetterling. Um, now, this takes place in Minnesota, uh, though that's far away from here, and it was in a different time than now. I mean, this yeah. was in 1989, and we're now in 2019. Uh, but, you know, you, you've got a son, and I've got a son. I have actually got an 11-year-old son, and that was the same age of... Uh, Jacob at the time. Right. So it's kind of one of those stories that, you know, as a father can kind of hit home. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Every parent's worst nightmare for sure. For sure. You know, and this was a time that child abduction, you know, in the 80s, especially the mid 80s, late 80s, you know, they were doing a lot of that uh, missing children on the on the milk carton. On the milk carton. Yeah. Um, So this was a time that this was really starting to come up into the into the regular media, you know, the five o'clock news right. every single day when families would sit down and have their dinner. Right, right. And there was probably a time in America that this was the most popular missing children cases. Uh, you know, you know what I mean. Like right. Up there with the uh, the uh, Johnny Gosh and the Adam Walsh, Adam Walsh uh, cases. I believe his father even did some work on this one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Yeah, so this story uh, starts out um, in in Saint Saint Joseph, Minnesota. Yes. Uh, so actually, and the date was in uh, it was in the fall. It was October twenty second of nineteen eighty nine. This was on a Sunday, and the kids didn't have school the next day. Okay, so it was kind of one of those awesome Sundays. You know, put yourself in the shoes and the mindset of an eleven year old. This is fantastic, right? Right. You've got uh, Jacob. He's eleven years old at the time. You have his best friend staying over, Aaron Larson, who's also 11. He, you've got his younger brother, Trevor, who's 10, so he's one year younger, probably looked up to Jacob. Right, right. You know? And it, from what I understand, um, their their parents were actually gone at, a, at like some banquet or something? Yeah, they were gone about 30 miles away at a banquet. And they also put the boys in charge of uh, watching their younger sister, Carmen, right, who was right. eight at the time. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, it's 1989. This is a different time, man. You know, right. so it was okay to leave a couple of 11-year-olds and a 10-year-old, you know, just kind of hanging out and while you're gone for a couple of hours to go have some dinner. You know, people wouldn't do that nowadays. Right. But this is a different time, you know? Yeah. So the boys kind of decide they maybe want to have a, a fun little... Little boys night, I guess. And uh, they call his parents and ask if they can ride their bikes to the video store. Yes, this was called a Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb. And, and what I picture this place to be is like one of those smaller convenience store type of places. Get some snacks, maybe a pizza, that kind of stuff. Uh, but you could also rent VHS tapes. What's a VHS tape? Yeah, to those uh, younger <laughs> listeners here, uh, we used to rent these blocks, these black <laughs> squares that we would stick in these giant machines that are much larger than a DVD player. And you'd have to watch it, rewind it, and but there was movie rentals everywhere. This everywhere. Was, this was a very popular thing to have in the 1980s and through most of our childhood yeah. growing up. Nothing was funner as a child than, than going to the Blockbuster or something on a Friday night, get your get your new movies that you're going to rent. Yeah, you know, so, uh, so they called the parents, right? And originally the mother was kind of against it, you know. But I think like a lot of fathers, especially like my father who doesn't, you know, 
Yeah, whatever. Give them some freedom. Give them you know, some freedom. They're just go, they're going they down the road less than a mile. Yeah. To go get this movie or whatever, they'll be right back. Give us a call when you get back. You know. I mean, it's obviously a much different time, but um, as a parent, I I understand where he's coming from, but it's also nine o'clock at night. I don't know if I'd let them be riding down the back roads on their bikes at nine nine o'clock at night. That's true. In October, where it's probably getting dark pretty early. Uh, yeah, you're right. I know it is. It's got to be. But they end up giving in. Hey, whatever. This is a small town. Crimes like this don't really happen there. Right. You know, this is just one of those times, right? Back in those times, rather. Uh, so what they end up doing is they get the, the okay. They contact their neighbor, who whose name is Rochelle. Uh, she was somebody that had babysat for the Weatherlings on the regular. So this was, hey, whatever, sure. Leave the house, walk a you know, few feet to get to the Weatherling house, and watch the uh, younger sister... Carmen, well, the boys take off to go do uh, this little errand. Right, right. They to go rent the movie. They make it to the Tom Thumb. Right, and while they uh, are at the Tom Thumb store, uh, they decide to rent the movie uh, Naked Gun. I love that movie. Great choice, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, they rent the Naked Gun movie. It's 9 o'clock at night, so they're probably getting close to closing time. So the kids grab their movie, and they decide to bike back home. No, no, no doubt is it dark. I wonder if there's street lights. That's a very good question. I wonder if there is. Uh, in my mind, when I picture the story, I kind of picture there being street lights, but who knows? But it's dangerous if there isn't street lights, but it could also be dangerous even if there is, because in my experience, road with uh, roads with street lights are usually pretty busy roads. That's a good point. And I couldn't. This actually, I don't believe to be a very busy area. Right. So the boys are on their way home. All three of the boys, you know, they get their movie, probably some snacks. I don't know. I would imagine some snacks if it were like my kids. I'm sure. And uh, coming out from between a couple of vehicles is a man, okay? Now, they can't really make out this man's face. This man has some kind of a, maybe a nylon or something pulled over his face. And he orders them into the woods, into the, down the ditch, and kind of away from any kind of eye that might see what's going to happen. Right, right. Now, he immediately looks at Trevor. Now, this is the 10-year-old brother of Jacob, and orders him to go home. He says, get out of here. Basically tells him, if you turn around and look, I'm going to shoot you, right? Right, right. Then what you have next, he ha- he takes both boys. He takes Aaron and he takes Jacob. And he kind of looks them over uh, the way that the story is told uh, later on. Kind of almost the way I envision, almost looking them over like... Like, like a creep. The way you would look over like what onion or bunch of bananas you're going to grab at the grocery store kind of a thing like you know what i mean right right it, and then he he grabs aaron by the genitals and kind of fondles it for a moment and says get out of here he put, and, he, and he has a gun also which he got garnished earlier right and he event. tells him he tells him as well that if he turns around he's going to shoot him so um obviously I, I just picture this 11 year old kid probably turning and running and not looking back i'd imagine he may, he was he must have been terrified and he takes off, and that leaves the, the perpetrator with Jacob, who unfortunately has not been seen alive since this event. Right, right. And this was on uh, October 22nd, so um, at this point, there's a 911 call? Well, what happens is the boys make it back to their house, okay, where Rochelle is with their sister, and they immediately t- uh, you know, recant the story to Rochelle, who, being a smart kid, calls her father, who's not that far by, you know? Right. And he immediately calls 911, and then immediately alerts the Weatherlings. And they, of course, leave their banquet, and they make it back. Now, I'm assuming that they would think that Jacob must have just walked off, it must have been whatever. But it is alarming, and the, and the police in uh, St. Joseph... They take to action rather quickly, which right, is right. great because a lot of times, you know, they have that you got to wait. So, you know, what, what, 24 hours? Is that what it is? Yeah, normally. They're a little more lean with, lean in with children, though. So they do kind of, you know, they respond, and uh, that's kind of 
Yeah, they organize a search, and you know, within just a couple of days later, they've got uh, deputies on horseback and hundreds of people from the community, you know, searching for Jacob around these areas where he went missing. And you and know, it's got to be cold. It's got to be cold. And uh, just a week later, they actually bring in the National Guard, about two hundred and twenty-five troops, and also uh, it's eighty people from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Who uh, you know are looking in you know lakes, streams, rivers, things like that, trying to find any sign of this boy. Yeah, there was even more than one thousand white balloons that were launched after a church service. So that must have been can't get away with that now. Kind of, I know, right? All that, <laughs> all that rubber going in the air, but you certainly can see the uh, the gesture behind it. You know, you do have a community here that is rallying behind uh, this family and this missing child. Right. So. Right. Unfortunately, don't you hate how it takes these tragic events to bring communities together? Yeah, it's it's so true. I mean, people that maybe would just walk by each other in a grocery store and not say hi are suddenly stopping in every line they're in to, to talk about this case. There's tips that pour in, you know, left and right, you know, like always. But they always seem to lead to uh, dead ends. Right, right. Uh, investigators are actually just inundated with tips after they released a sketch of the suspect. And this um, was in December. Right, right. And they also say they believe the man who kidnapped Jacob was most likely uh, responsible for other, a rash of other, like, uh, fondlings and, and things like that in the area. Other attacks on children. Right, right. And unfortunately, uh, after this sketch was released, there there was uh, no, no tips that came in to help solve it at that time. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, they're... Uh... Every avenue that they investigated, and, and they did, the community, the, the authorities, every avenue was, was, was chased. They chased everything to, till there was an end, and then they would take a step back, and they would reevaluate the way they were looking at this case, but things just continued to not show any kind of uh, resolution coming. Do you know one thing that is weird to me? I mean, I know the way police work works with investigations, but... They say this man came out of a driveway when he met these children. Whose driveway? What driveway? Does the people who live in that house, did they have a guest? You know, how are they... Did, oh, I, they I, interviewed the whole... Every, I'm sure they did, but like, I'm wondering if this guy maybe had been uh, maybe robbing a house in the area or something. They interviewed everybody. Nobody had seen anything. There was no, nobody that had seen anything... That had led to 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 much. In fact, there was one man who, just a few days after the fact, had said that he had seen a vehicle. Really? Yeah. And the police kind of looked into what he said, and then they started looking at him. This guy, you know, it, it just sucks for this guy because he obviously we know now as time has gone on, and I can't think of his name right now, unfortunately. Right. Right. It's um, unfortunate but, when you when you try to help with these uh, investigations, and the eye just gets turned to you. We well, saw that well, in the Delphi right. case as well. Because what had happened was, the police are looking at him. This guy is a school teacher. He's a, a music teacher. And he lives with his parents. He, I think, was in his 30s. And his parents were off, I think, in Europe. They were somewhere out of the country on vacation. So they're like, oh, they, they kind of occupy themselves with this car idea a little bit. And then they're kind of like, Oh, well, let's kind of look at the guy that's telling us this story. Right. This person that's coming up with something. Thinking may he, have, may he, he may have put in a false tip to uh, change the direction of the investigation. Right. You know, so they questioned this guy, and he, he became a suspect rather quickly. And they looked at him for a number of years, and he had kind of remained as a suspect uh, until everything kind of unwound. Right. Not, not, I don't think they looked at him necessarily as a solid lead. But definitely a they person were of interest. About them. Right, right. Yes. Right. So, um, in the early the next year, nineteen ninety, um, Jacob's parents, the Patty and Jerry, actually set up the, the Jacob Wetterling Resource Center, which works to help communities and families prevent child exploitation. And Patty also becomes a national advocate for missing children at this time. Yeah, you know, and as a father, both of us, right. really, could you imagine how these parents must have felt? It's like you have a child that's born. You know, you take care of this child, you love this child, you teach this child, you know, it's part of your life for 11 years, and then all of a sudden, it's ripped from you. Right. And you now need to move on, and, you know, they have other children, you know, they still got their, their son and their uh, their daughter, 
but their life is different. Their family's different. I could not imagine what it must have felt like for these people. And for, for Patty to not wither away in her home and just kind of fall apart and, and die. And, and oftentimes in these cases, you see the family split up. You see the, the you know, with, with the, the guilt that they feel comes arguments and then a lot of times they, you know there's a divorce and right right and you know i can only imagine as a parent as well like if something like this happens to you you want to get out there and make sure that no other family will ever have to go through something like this right well there's two things that usually happen there's people that that take that negative turn and they fall apart and there's some people that Somehow pull it together and it almost... the rest of their life to that memory of the child. It almost seems like they get some kind of inner strength that you can only get from surviving a terrible thing like this. Absolutely. And that's what brought, you know, the parents out and and all the change that's happened in, you know, in law and stuff. Uh, October of 1990, an FBI spokesperson says that 2,000 people had been interviewed. That's, that's a lot. That's a freaking lot. I wonder what the, you know... 2,000 people, this is a relatively small town, so that's, I wonder if they were, you know, interviewing people from away from the area. I, I believe they even looked at some people from other states. Right, right. Yeah. More than 700 people attended an anniversary vigil less than two miles from where J- Jacob was taken. That's a big turnout. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, in uh, 1994, Congress actually passes the Jacob Wetterling Act, uh, which is actually, like, uh, for the sex offender registry. Yeah, you're starting to see, unfortunately, from these terrible things, changes that had happened in the 80s that have been, that still are implemented and affect our lives today. Absolutely, and something like that, whenever a tragedy like this happens, you always think about what could have prevented it, and there's a lot of things that aren't against the law or in the law to, at all, and they always end up passing these acts to try to make sure that like these loopholes don't happen again. Realistically, you should know if there's a sex offender in your area. Of course. But this wasn't, that wasn't the case until 1994 when all this happened. That's very true. That's very true, you know, so. Uh, but Patty Weatherling, being as you know, a strong person that she is and wanting to be an advocate for change and for what's best for people and to somebody that wants to try to prevent these kind of things from happening to other children and other, other families. She runs uh, for office. Uh, wow. She, yep. Patty Weatherling, she runs as a Democrat against Republican U.S. Representative Mark Kennedy, if it matters to you, in Minnesota's 6th District. Right, right. Well, she actually, unfortunately uh, for her, loses this election by about 30,000 votes. So uh, this was her first political campaign, but she, she does say that... Uh, she may continue to uh, to run for office. During this time, she does continue to be an advocate for missing children and you know sex trafficking and all of these things because her you know her entire life has been changed. It's, it's now been and, and her husband's. It's now all about this, and they even over the years have received tips. A calls to them personally in right. the middle of the night. You know they get phone calls two o'clock in the morning at times. You know like, oh, I know where Jacob is and he's dead. I mean, could you imagine getting these kind of calls? No, that'd be absolutely terrifying. And, and unfortunately, I mean, where she said in in the public eye, there may be some people who want to get their fifteen minutes of fame by doing something like that. They were getting phone calls from psychics. Police even at points use psychics. Yeah, you see that in a lot of cases, uh, especially around this time. But in um, in 2010, uh, investigators actually spent a couple of days digging at a farm uh, near where he was last seen. I wonder if this came uh, from a tip. Yeah, I wonder how that happened because I kind of looked into it, and it's very hard to kind of get the feel for how things were nine years ago. Right. But it was almost like this was this information broke to the media in this information alone. It wasn't like... Oh, we're thinking it's this person here and this and that, and this is where we're looking. It was we're digging in regards to some kind of tip that, that we're not willing to release at this time. Right, right. And I guess um, you know when the, when the sheriffs actually go to this property, there were some items, and uh, they were actually taken from the park, from the farm, but unfortunately they didn't show any any link to the crime of Jacob. Yeah, you know what they were. This guy here. 
he and he didn't do it, so I'm not gonna like you know get too far into him. But he had admitted to a his psychiatrist that in the fifties he had harmed some children. Really, they were around the same age, and you know I know there's like this patient confidentiality type of type of thing, and I'm not sure if the count the advisor you know the counselor was the one that went to the authorities with this, or if he was able to coax this guy, which I'm not even going to say his name, just right. because, into uh, coming forth with this. Um, but either way, they check his place, and uh, well, one of the things that they take is a picture of a child that was fishing, and somehow they knew that this was taken in Georgia, Hmm. And there was, and it had. I think it might have even said the the name and the place in Georgia and the date on it. And that that year, there was a child that had gone missing in Georgia that fit that. Wow. That description. Now, I'm not certain if they were able to link him to that. I don't think they have necessarily. Wow, uh, that's that's crazy though. Yeah, and uh, after after a few years uh, in May of 2014, so we're looking at almost 25 years after this crime. Uh, investigators actually say that they're taking another look at a series of uh, attempted and actual uh, molestations and um, kidnappings that occurred in the Painesville area, which happened just two years before Jacob's abduction and murder. I feel like at this time in 2014, with this being an obvious cold case, it's almost like you got new eyes looking at it and they're saying, you know what, we're going to press the reset button. We're going to take ourselves back to 1989 and try to see what was going on in this community at this time. Who were the players in this neighborhood? You know, what's going on? And with that, they've been able to connect A, B, and C, and they've found a few interesting people to look at. Right, right. And uh, sometimes, as, we, as we've seen in a lot of cases, sometimes just that fresh set of eyes can make all, all the difference in the world. So um, this guy looks at this case, this new investigator, and he finds out that between summer of 1986 and the spring of 1987, five teenage boys were attacked in that area, but nobody was ever arrested for any of these crimes. Interesting. Could it have been the same guy? It definitely could have been. I mean, somebody who uh, knows the area would, would be my guess. And the fact is, these are our rare crimes. You see them on the media all the time, but they are rare crimes. What are the odds that there's two or maybe three people in this community that's a you know, small town community type farmland type area that would be up to this horrendous, these horrendous acts. Right, right. And what's interesting, we, we know this from, from doing this podcast and other projects we've done, but there's always somebody with every case that you cover that this is their life. Like they dig into this case and they dig into this case and they know the ins and outs. And in this case, this is actually uh, important because an internet blogger actually brought this information to the investigators so they were able to interview some of these victims again. Yeah, good work to that internet blogger. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so, great tip. Absolutely. Probably one of the best tips, you right. know, kind of to, if for nothing else, to bring this case back into the attention of the community and those that really care. Right, right. And, um, they also find out during this time that they, after after all the you know the interviews with these victims, they find out that investigators actually think that these attacks on these other people were not random and they could actually be connected to Jacob's abduction. Now that is very interesting. So after 25 years of searching and this new spark leading to more searching, the police finally have a person of interest, a new one. In October of 2015. Right, they do. His name is uh, Danny Heinrich. Danny he was, Heinrich, yes. Yes, Heinrich. And he was actually named uh, as a person of interest, which isn't quite a suspect, but he's definitely now on the FBI's radar. Strong enough to announce this publicly. Right, right. Uh, he had been questioned by the FBI on December 16th of 1989. So this is just shortly, you know, within a few weeks of the event happening. Right, right. And DNA samples were taken, uh, but he was not charged with the crime and was released. I wonder why, uh, I'm, I'm guessing they probably just didn't have enough evidence. Um, well, but... they didn't have the body. They didn't have the body, so they took his DNA 
and they didn't find anything to reference it against. Well, they did actually uh, match it to uh, DNA that was found in the abduction of 12-year-old Jared Shrill in Cold Spring, Minnesota, uh, which was in January of 1989. Wow. You know, I'm surprised this guy wasn't heavily looked at at this time. That's you know? what I would think. I mean, they, they obviously were looking at him as a suspect, but shit, it takes a, a real shitbag to... To do something like this, you know? Right, right. How many people around your community do you think are doing this and it's not worth taking a heavy look into this guy? Right, right. Especially his DNA was actually found, so he obviously had something to do with it. But unfortunately for investigators, the statute of limitations had actually expired um, for that kidnapping in Cold Spring. Oh, I understand. Okay. Which meant that he couldn't be arrested for the crime yeah. at that time. But he actually, uh, the judge did reward a search warrant Um and child pornography was found in this house. So this guy clearly uh, was not rehabilitated. Not at all. And this led to his arrest in October of 2015. And right off the bat, after he's arrested, Heinrich actually decided that he wanted to cooperate with the authorities uh, and reached a plea agreement with them. Of course. This guy here, selfish his entire life, and now he's... Uh, He's ready to come clean, but he's only willing to come clean if he can make the situation better for himself. Right, right. And uh, just a week after he was arrested on September 1st uh, in 2016, he actually led investigators to a burial site. Wow. So he, this is a little story here, a little backstory on this, right? He says that he did the, he committed the crime, right? Now, the plea deal is, is in, and we're going to kind of cover this a little bit more, but it's so good for him that they ran it past the Wetterling family and they okayed this plea deal um, because they wanted closure. You right, know, it had right. been almost 30 years. But he had to be able to produce a body. No body, no deal. Okay? So that was kind of a, a stipulation on the, uh, on the plea re agreement. Right, right. So he does uh, bring him to that burial site, and when they get there, they find Jacob's clothing and also human remains. And this is in uh, in Painesville, where those other crimes had happened. Wow. It's only about 30 miles away from uh, where he was abducted. I wonder how many kids this, this freaking sicko did this to, or did similar things to. Maybe not necessarily killed, but how many people he had done this to. Right, right. That area obviously had, had quite a few of these cases back then. Awful. Now, he, you know, takes him to this body, but does he end up telling them any of the details uh, of his, his, him doing this crime? Yeah, actually, what he, has, uh, what he has come forward with as far as the information for that night was that after he had sent those other boys off, which we already had covered that part of the story, he does... Uh, sexually assaults uh, Jacob, and I, I, it's almost like he doesn't know what to do after he's done this crime. Like, how do you cover up this kind of a thing? Now, do you let this kid go, and he's going to say something? Um, so what does he end up doing? You know, he, he takes, obviously, the... continues down that darker path where he says to Jacob that he's got to... You know, they're kind of in the, a wooded area. He says to Jacob that he's got to use... The, the bathroom he's going to take a piss and not to look at him to turn around so jacob turns around and he's facing away and what this guy ends up doing is he shoots jacob in the head that's awful yeah yeah terrible terrible so he does this and now he's got jacob's remains that he's got to you know get disposed of you could say and so there is a construction site not terribly far away that he knows about which now tells me that he most likely had a vehicle. And so that guy that they gave a hard time to, th that he reported seeing a vehicle, they maybe should have followed up maybe a little bit more on that tip. Right. Because, you know, Heinrich would have had a vehicle uh, where he took Jacob's remains to a an, an ongoing construction site that he had known about. And... He takes a piece of uh, machinery, like a bobcat kind of a thing, and he digs a shallow hole. And that's where he puts Jacob's remains in and then buries it over. Now, approximately a year later, he's, you know, this is something, you know, how these kind of guys are. I'm sure this, this, this night was, this, this terrible night was something that was on his mind all the time and his right. sick perversions, you know. 
He went back to the site where he had buried Jacob. But to his surprise, Jacob was wearing a hockey jer- uh, jacket. You know, those thin, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, polyester or whatever type, windbreaker type jackets. That was sticking up out of the dirt. Oh, wow. Yeah. So um, Heinrich ends up digging up Jacob's remains. And here again, you know, a year later, and moves them to another site, the site where these remains were found. Wow. Uh, what, 27 years later? Right, right. He actually says that. Um during you know the night that he did these crimes, he actually was able to avoid the police because he was listening to the police scanner as he uh, as he was doing the crime. I always thought it would be cool to have a police scanner just to listen to what's going on in the commu- community. You know what I mean? Uh, I've just heard it. of, it's pretty interesting. Out of being nosy, but this guy actually used it as a tool to evade being captured to mm-hmm. go where the police were not. Don't go back to the Tom Thumb area. Right, right. So you know, of course, he he gives all these details. Um, and he does get his plea agreement. What, what exactly did he reach for an agreement? Well, in the plea agreement, Heinrich agreed to, a, to plead guilty to one count of the 25 federal child pornography charges brought against him. Wow, only one. Child pornography. In addition to revealing the location of the body, which, as we stated, he had done, and, pl- and, pl- and in pleading guilty, he also agrees to testify as to the details of the Wetterling crime. So the information that we had just gotten into, he was obligated to say this on the stand. Now, in exchange for his plea, this guy is sentenced to the maximum prison term of 20 years for the child pornography charges. He's also going to be obligated to register as a sex offender upon his release. Right, right. That's it. What's scary about this, though, is he could possibly be be released in 17 years from the start of his uh, his prison sentence. He would be fairly old, but you never know. You never know. I mean, this guy, I don't think, could be rehabilitated. He, for 27 years, lived a life with no guilt for what he had done. This case had been in the media for 27 years. This family, uh, Patty Weatherling, she has been in the news for 27 years. Or, you know, And the public eye. And the public eye. Broken heart. He's, he's seen her for 27 years. And never once prior did he think, oh, now I'm in a position where I'm, I'm getting in trouble for this and that. Let's see if I can, you know sweeten the deal up for myself and give up some information. What does he do? He takes full advantage uh, of the situation. Really, if you think about it. Right, he does. Because yeah. now he's going to use this as a playing card in order to make his time in prison a little bit easier. You know, and the card being the fact that this family wants closure and they'd be most likely willing to accept this kind of a plea deal, which they did. Right. Which I can obviously see why they would. Right. And then in two, two years later, after he's in jail, he actually gets transferred to a federal medical center uh, in Massachusetts. So that's an even cushier situation for himself. Yeah. This is... Uh... But the thing is, like I said in the beginning, there is a slight silver lining to the story, if you could even consider it to be that. And that is the fact that the Weatherlings did have Jacob back, and they were able to give him a proper burial. And they were... You know, they know what happened that night. They do have some kind of a closure, though I'm sure the wound is still something that's never going to go away for them. Right, right. And, of course, the other things, too, is, um, you know, the Jacob Wetterling Foundation that his parents founded, and also uh, when con- Congress passed the uh, Jacob Wetterling Act. And uh, also there's uh, a bridge in St. Cloud, Minnesota, uh, that crosses over the Mississippi River called the Bridge of Hope, which is actually named uh, in honor of Jacob. Yeah, you know, and another person that I'm glad uh, there was some closure in this for was his friend Aaron Larson, who, you know, had been on... You, you've seen him pop up on, on the media regularly when, in, you know, association with this case. And that event, you know, I, I think was something that had you know affected him mentally survivor's guilt for sure and i think it still does every time you see this guy and he talks about it it's it's just you know well it's so scary because i mean he he was fondled by this guy and the the guy was also basically the guy was choosing between jacob and him do the people that commit these crimes stop to think about more than just the victim that the person that they're victimizing but almost the ripple effect that it causes throughout that family, throughout the community. Do you think they realize this stuff? I don't think they care. I think that, as you said before, they're they're not concerned about your feelings. They're only concerned with their perversions and things like that. 
And of course, the longer you get away with these crimes, you know, the more you're going to be comfortable. Yeah. So this, um, this is a really a big case. You know, it did bring, you know, like you stated earlier, a lot of change, especially now with the registration of sex offenders. Right. You know, it's kind of interesting that, interesting in a strange way that this child's murder and abduction in 1989, right, caused this act to be, you know, this change uh, of registry in, to come into play in 1994. The guy that actually comes clean with the crime is now subject to that law if he's released in 17 years. Yeah, a little years. bit of poetic justice, I guess. It's kind of a, an interesting way, an interesting view of how that kind of came, came around. But I personally hope this guy never gets out. Yeah, I don't think he will. I don't think the he will. The fact he's in a medical center leads me to believe he's probably not in the, the best health either. Yeah, and uh, he's definitely somebody that deserves a little prison justice. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. But... Uh, yeah, this was definitely, uh, you know, Jason, a case that I found interesting for a long time, you know. I wasn't, uh, I wasn't too familiar with this case until you brought it up to me, but it's definitely uh, a very unique case, you know. We don't see too many of these that end well, unfortunately, and, and like you stated earlier, this time period, unfortunately, was just known for these types of crimes. Yeah, yeah. So, and once again, I'd like to thank everybody for... Uh, listening to the rigor mortis podcast we're getting a lot of great feedback from people keep the emails coming absolutely and uh we appreciate all the views and all the comments and and positive feedback that you've given us and continue to share with your friends till next time everybody bye hey guys we're not hard to find you can find us on facebook instagram twitter at the rigor mortis podcast yep and also our email the rigor mortis podcast at gmail.com i love the emails guys while i'm on my lunch break at work This is something I look forward to reading, so please keep me entertained and keep our inbox full. Yes, absolutely. Let us know if you love the show. Let us know um, what we can improve on, and uh, you know if you have any other uh, suggestions for us, we'd love to hear those as well. Yeah, we definitely love listener suggestions. Keep them coming in. We've gotten great feedback so far. Absolutely, and we have our most important, probably, uh, social media would be the the Rigor Mortis Podcast Patreon page. Yes, please, please take a look at our Patreon page. You know where... An independent podcast. We don't have a whole lot of money to do this. We're kind of doing it as a passion uh, and a hobby uh, that we want to pursue. Absolutely. And every minute we're out here working on this is uh, uh, one more minute that our wives are getting upset with us. So. Yeah. So please help us justify that to our wives as well as help us to grow the show. Uh, this show is brought to you by people like you. Absolutely. And all your donations uh, just help us to make the show better and do more editing. Uh, and be able to put more back into you. And like we were saying, if we can justify this to our wives, then we can certainly justify putting out a couple more episodes a week. Absolutely. And uh, thank you guys always for listening. Yes, goodbye. Still missing tonight, Jacob Wetterling, age 11. This was one more day of agony for St. Joseph, Minnesota, population 3,200. The kind of place where you don't expect a child to be kidnapped at gunpoint. NBC's Dan Molina. It looks like a happy enough Halloween party, but this is a time of very real fear for the people of St. Joseph, and this song is their one source of comfort. It's Jacob Wetterling's favorite. The search for the boy has been massive. It's the most feared type of abduction, one by a complete stranger. No ransom note, no contact. This is where it happened, less than a mile from Jacob's house. It's back over that way. Jacob, his little brother, and one other boy had gone to a convenience store to rent a videotape. When they reached this spot, they saw the man dressed in black holding the gun. Jacob's brother, Trevor. He told us to put our bikes in the ditch and lay down, and then... He asked them their ages. Jacob answered 11, and these two boys were then told to run away. This entire community and several surrounding towns are helping in the search for Jacob and comforting his family. His mother, Patty, deeply moved by the prayers offered at this weekend vigil. He'll be home soon. He had to feel that you guys are coming home soon. It, it was instant panic. I mean, we were but in touch with it right away. I truly believed he'd be he'd be back by morning. I just, I couldn't, I can't fathom this. Everywhere around the world, the heartbeat sounds the same. 
day after day, Jacob's song is sung and played here. Each day that brings hope also brings another day of, of loneliness and fear. Two days ago, there was a sighting of a man with a boy who looked like Jacob. Since then, nothing. Dan Molina, NBC News, St. Joseph, Minnesota.